Also, the staff said, and I know it's like that theory that the schedule could work for the first time. Yeah. It's the TA. It's the TA. Oh, it's the TA. Oh, it's the TA. It's the TA. It's the TA. It's the TA. So we need to prepare like for this. <laughs> I mean, there's always like a ton of people. Yeah. Where is it? Yeah, I mean, I mean hopefully, hopefully it will be. Where is it from? Uh, I think we have it. Should be by the sort of Saddam or Trump, like either Tempest or this. So one is like really bad, like half book, and then the other one is like. Yeah, this is 
Yes, it is. It means you can't take it, though. <laughs> and put your name on it. <laughs> Computing. Some of you are working that field, some of you aren't. So I'm really trying to gear these lectures towards people who have no idea what quantum healing is. You want to know about it, what are all the controversies, so on and so forth. So I'll put everyone on, on a common level there. Okay. So I put together a series of three lectures. They do link together. Um, I will try to be sort of kind and gentle on the way as I, as I work my way through here. No harsh derivations. This is a summer school. I see the word summer in that. That means you don't want to sit here and take long notes. Uh, I remember those days. It was only a decade ago. I was on the other side there. Um, so, um, but each time I go to the next lecture, I'll just give you one or two slides just to remind you where we were on the preceding day and put, put pieces together. My first lecture here, number one, quantum kneeling fundamentals. I'm not even going to talk about D-Wave hardware today. Rather, it's just very basics defining <coughs> quantum kneeling. I'm actually going to be discussing a condensed matter system. So I'm going to be looking at experiments that were done by a Gabe Apley's group. When there's a fellow Gabe Apley who was at University of Chicago at the time, now at ETH Zurich, who did, who did a very famous experiment, which sort of almost looked like the first sort of experimental uh, uh, existence proof of quantum needling doing something useful for you. Okay, so my general rough plan here, so you know where we're going here. Lecture one is just my general introduction. Lecture two tomorrow, that's where we're going to go into D-Wave superconducting hardware, guide you through the hardware, and then a basic demonstration on a small scale device to show you, yes, indeed, it can, it can work in principle. And finally, lecture three, to me, this is the fun stuff. Um, we're going to be going on looking at large scale experiments, and we're, in particular, we're going to try to use D-Wave hardware as a quantum simulator and going after quantum phase transitions in large systems, like 500 spins on a 3D lattice. Okay, so on to the fundamentals here. So the first slide I put up here, just to get people thinking about this, is, is really the connections between computing and natural systems, and what we see happening in nature. Um, this quote that I put up on the top, um, nature doesn't solve, it optimizes. This is from a fellow by the name of Goran Wenden. Um, if you work in the field of superconducting electronics, you probably know this name. He's one of the distinguished gentlemen in the field um, at Chalmers University. Um, now, where this is relevant to me here is Goran was puzzling over the D-Wave hardware. He was looking at it and saying, this thing is not the quantum computer that I know that everyone else seems to be building, yet somehow it seemed to be computing. What's going on? Um, and sort of the way he rationalized and come, came with it in the end is that, oh, well, maybe it's a different way of looking at computing. Maybe now we're looking at a two-way conversation in, uh, in this whole process. We're very used to starting on the left here, starting with our computers and our, and our code and using those things to simulate something in nature. So we look at large scale, scale structure in the universe, condensed matter systems, take your pick. We often, as certainly you as graduate students, me, me as well, we all use digital computers to help us learn those things along the way. How often does conversation go the other way back though? 
how often do we pick out a physical process that's happening in the universe and say, maybe we can actually harness that to do some computing. And that's what we're going to be about here today. And that's what I'm going to discuss as quantum annealing. Okay. So here's my quick outline for today's, for, day, for today's lecture number one. I will do my best to sort of slowly and gently finish on time because I'm between you and lunch and I know that's trouble. Um, so number one, I'll just define quantum annealing, um, leading up to it by going through thermal annealing as well, as, as just to get, get the creative juices going here. And then I'm going to switch over to my case study where I'm going to be looking at a condensed matter system and applying quantum annealing to that condensed matter system. Then, of course, we have to look at, well, how do the wheels fall off the cart? How do things break down? Where will quantum annealing fail you? And we'll go through some, some of the, what I consider as sort of the, you know, the four deadliest forms, the forms of pitfalls that you're going to run into. If I have time, we're finishing reasonably well, we'll discuss this question of universality, quantum annealing, where it could go. Okay, so on to the definitions of quantum computing. I think the first place we'll start here is the definition of thermal annealing. This is probably something you have some semblance of that happens in the world. People use it as a, as a technological process. It has been done so, used so for a very long time. For instance, in metallurgy, uh, if you're preparing steels and hardening things. Generally, you can think about this as a process where if I have some natural system that has a continuous potential, as I've drawn over there on your top right. Say there's some, some continuous potential there as a function of some parameter. I just made a 1D potential to make it easy here. Let's say that potential has local minima and somewhere in there is a global minima. That global minimum represents an optimal state for that system. How do we find that, or how do we help that natural system get into that optimal state? So the one process you can do here is, well, thermal annealing says, start out with a system at a very high temperature. You can say the state of the system is like a ball that's rolling around that potential. Now, if I have the temperature cranked up very high, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be rolling all over the place in that landscape. I'll be going up and down and sampling it all over the place. Thermal annealing algorithm says, now gently step down that temperature, slowly, slowly, ever so carefully. And the idea is, as I run it along, eventually once my, my temperature is getting comparable to sort of barriers that, are, that, are, that occur in this energy landscape, eventually I get in a regime where I'm going to see that relaxation processes are going to be more dominant than excitation processes, which would then kick you out of, the, out of these local minima. So there's going to be this downward trend in the probability of finding the system in any given state. We're going to slowly avoid the high energy states. However, you can see that the search process, this ball, is becoming increasingly local as I do this. And there's always a risk that I could end up being stuck over here, in which case I'm sampling around a local minimum and no longer a global minimum. And finally, once I cool myself down to a very low temperature, I end up trapped in the local minima. If I do things right, I'm going to end up over here in the global minimum with reasonable probability. But there's also a reasonable probability I'm going to be stuck in this local minima. That's just the nature of the beast. That's the way these sorts of things work out in the end. So of course, this is a physical process. And that has actually informed the conversation in terms of optimization algorithms that we can implement on a digital computer. So a particular example of that is simulated annealing. Uh, so I give you this reference down the paper, uh, reference down the bottom here, uh, David Kirkpatrick and company. Um, it's a very famous paper from, from the 1980s where just to give the cartoon some connection back to what I had before is you can see my, my drawings over here. What I've done is I have my shaded potential in the background here. Let's say I find some creative way to discretize it. I find out where, where are all those local minima that have my potential. I've just drawn those as discrete lines now and said, those are discrete states of the system. Now, the question is, how do I find the lowest energy configuration of that system using something that looks somewhat like thermal annealing, but something I can implement on a digital computer? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start out, I'm going to run a temperature profile. I'm going to start at a very high temperature compared to all those energy spacings that you see there. And I'm going to go through a temperature sequence where I just slowly start lowering it down. Every time I'm at, I'm at one of those intermediate temperatures, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause it. I'm going to perform a bunch of random moves in this, in this, uh, in this, in this discrete state space. So I'm at that state with the red dot you can see in the top right diagram here. One possible move is, well, I change state and I go downward. And I say, well, that's generally good. That sounds like I'm heading towards something that's more optimal. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take that move no matter what. So a probability one, anytime I just posit a random move that lowers the energy, I'm going to take it. 
I can also posit what happens if I, if I make a move that raises my energy. So naively, you may think, well, maybe that's not such a great idea. I'm increasing my energy. Maybe I'm walking away from a minimum. But on the other hand, if you're worried about coughing over energy barriers, you need to let yourself do this at some point, or at least early in the annealing pr process. So that way you can sort of pop yourself at a local minima and go explore the landscape some more, hopefully getting down to, getting down to a global minimum. So in this case, if I have a positive energy difference, what I'm going to say is, well, I'm going to accept that thing probabilistically. So I'm going to go with something that's e to the minus k, delta e over kt. And I'm going to say then, all right, well, I'm going to then take that probability of making that transition, and I'm going to generate some loaded dice based on those probability statistics. I roll on my dice, the Monte Carlo part of the process, and I say, all right, some fraction of the time I take that move, yes. Other times, no, nope, I just sit still right where I am with the, with the solid ram dot. And the whole procedure of simulated annealing then is I'm going to take that temperature, K, KT here, you, you see in the exponent, and I'm slowly working my way down. And this is indeed a tried and true algorithm. It works. It underpins a lot of simulated annealing variants that are out there available that you can implement on digital computers today. Okay, so on to quantum annealing. It's going to be a similar principle. Is so in picture of thermal annealing, what we're using is thermal activation. We're basically taking taking phonons or photons in some physical system, or using those to kick ourselves around the potential energy landscape, and then we're slowly bleeding off those excitations, hoping to guide ourselves down to some low energy state. Now the other process, another process proposed by Kanawaki and Nishimori was. Well, what if I have some system that I hold in a low energy state the whole time? Or I'm going to do this with a quantum system. And the reason why I want to do that is because it gives me access to quantum fluctuations, aka tunneling, to allow me to, to, to explore some, ener some landscape. So the general way you'll see these things phrased in theoretical textbooks is you'll see a quantum annealing Hamiltonian as I've written here where what you're going to do is you're going to smoothly interpolate between an initial Hamiltonian, this HI that I described in blue, and then HF, where that HF is the final Hamiltonian. And just being a little more explicit about this, this particular HF <coughs> that I've written here is a classical Hamiltonian that has local biases on my variables. So it's a bias spin up or spin down on each site. And then there's a spin-spin interaction, so a sigma-z, <coughs> sigma-z interaction available to this thing. The whole objective of this particular variant of the algorithm, as I'm, as I'm describing here, is to guide yourself into low energy states of that classical final Hamiltonian. But the idea is we're going to turn on first quantum mechanics to start us, get tunneling processes that get us all, all over the place. And if you are coherent, those tunneling processes give you superposition states. So you can think about the system starting in a very large macroscopic superposition, looking at all possible minima, minima that are available to that system. And as I slowly tune down the tunneling energy, I'm going to eventually increase or concentrate my probability on the lowest energy states. Yes? Um, so is the improved efficiency of this compared to the classical algorithm related to the improved efficiency of quantum random walks in searching for? So, yes, the same principle. I mean, quantum random walk is about having access to all possible states simultaneously. So, exactly it. All right. So there's my sort of, you know, no, no energy units or simplistic picture. Um, the other thing I should mention is that often you'll see in the literature is a parameter S that tunes you between these two Hamiltonians. So the way I've written it here, S is some function of time. Um, generally, when people are writing the very simple textbooks on this sort of stuff, you'll see that S is actually just runs from 0 to 1. Um, here, this can be any, linear, any metric you choose. It need not be linear in time. It can go, S can you know, increase rapidly at first. It could flatten out in the middle and then increase later. Whatever you choose. Just to be generic, I'm just calling it S of T. Okay, so if I go back to those cartoons, how does that whole picture work? And this is sort of a, the simple picture you can carry around in your head. The idea here is I'll start up my system with HI, my initial Hamiltonian. It should be something that's really simple for the system to be able to easily get into that ground state. Of the ground state. So in particular, if it looks like some harmonic oscillator with huge energy spacings between ground, first excited state, second excited state, all it takes is a very small amount of coupling to some environment somewhere out there, guaranteed. You're going to relax into 
relax on the ground state of this thing. There are no local minima. There's just a simple global minimum. It's easy to get to. And as I run my quantum kneeling algorithm, what you can think of as I'm slowly asserting that final Hamiltonian. So now this energy landscape starts to develop some features along the way. So most importantly, as I've drawn you here, as we have our system down in the ground state, as I've drawn here, and now my Hamiltonian slowly morphed, my potential slowly morphed, and I have these two sort of global, minim, global minima, or one part of me, one's a little, little more excited, a little excited compared to the ground state. Probability is spread out between those two. However, tunneling processes are what, what you're using to slowly distribute that probability between, the, between those large, large sort of valleys in the landscape. And then, if all goes well, what I eventually do is I've turned up, I completely asserted the final Hamiltonian at the end of the day. And if things have gone well, I will have probability down in the ground state over here. And of course, things cannot go well sometimes, and you end up stuck in local minima. All right, so on where we go. So can we come up with any sort of evidence, experimental evidence, that this actually happens in practice in the natural world? So the particular one to point to is this particular material, lithium, homium, yttrium fluoride. Um, no need to worry about it. It's a wolfram Wright structure. Um, just happens to be a system where you can substitute in substitute homium in the, into the yttrium site and actually get something that behaves like that Hamiltonian that I showed you earlier. So start that whole thing conversation off here. I'll start with where everyone will be familiar, and then we'll, we'll slowly increase the complexity. So if I first have a spin, a, a free spin sitting in a magnetic field, we all know what that does. That's the Zeeman splitting. So as I just turn on my magnetic field, my spin states are aligned with that magnetic field. So, so my spin states are coincident with the energy eigenbasis. So simple undergraduate physics. For condensed matter physicists, this is, becomes the one of the more interesting systems is take that free spin and confine it, put it in some sort of potential that has, has something that breaks the symmetry. So the previous case had that U1 rotational symmetry. Now I'm going to show you something with the U2 symmetry. So in particular, what if I have that spin half system and I stick it into a tetragonal unit cell like this? So now there's a clearly defined C axis that's different than the A and B axis. So this is something that happens in materials. So in particular, uh, if you have a rare earth element where your spin half is, say, is an F electron, or is an F electron. So, so in this case, it's, it's the homium, or, or pardon me, it's, yeah, um, pardon me, it's the yttrium that carries the spin half. Um, and, and what can happen here is the electric fields produced by, by, by the stuff that produce, gives you the unit cell actually then then says there's certain F electron orbitals that are preferred over others. So some become higher in energy, they will not be populated, and the low energy ones are the ones that are confined more or less in the plane here. And then you have spin orbit coupling between the nuclear spin and the electron spin, that, and that then constrains you to have a, a electron spin that's pointed up or down. So now we have a system where there is a clearly defined, clearly defined Ising at us. So this, become, this becomes an Ising spin. It, so it wants to be spin up, spin down, nowhere in between. So this is where the fun begins, is that if I apply a magnetic field to this system, that field orientation matters. So if I apply a longitudinal field in this direction, then I just get Zeeman splitting, all we've seen, be, seen before. However, if I apply a transverse field, so I'm into the AB plane here, spin can't, does not cant over. It doesn't follow it. Rather, it has to make this confused choice. Well, I can't be spin up or spin down to follow that field, field so what do I do? Go into a superposition state. So generically, for any arbitrary magnetic field, transverse or parallel, now my splitting looks like this over here, where the ground state becomes this, this positive superposition of spin up and spin down. First, the size state is that negative, comp, negative uh, mix of spin up and spin down. So this becomes known as the Ising spin in the transverse field. So of course, if you look for a transverse Ising model, you'll find whole textbooks on this. There's a large field, field of study that's gone to this from the 70s and 80s and 90s. So now let's crank up the complexity a little more. So we looked at a single Ising spin up to this point. What if I had a network of them? So I can make some crystal, and I randomly dope that crystal with, with these spin halves living in these, living, living in these unit cells with tetragonal symmetry. Now, of course, if they had nothing to do with each other, that'd be a boring system. 
However, it ends up that you get random interactions between these guys, spin-spin interactions. So depending upon the distance and the different atoms that are in between those sites, you can actually get a, an interaction that changes sign and magnitude. So now you end up with something that has a disordered or glassy ground state configuration of those spins. So a particular trivial example I've shown you here is just a, just a, just a triangular system where it has a, two ferromagnetic interactions, or pardon me, two antiferromagnetic interactions in red, and a ferromagnetic interaction in blue. And then we write a classical Hamiltonian for that thing, that H icing spin glass, as just a sum over the J's, sigma I, sigma, sigma, I, sigma J, and this easy interaction. So the question is, how do I get that thing, a crystal like that, guided into that low energy spin configuration? So if I have this picture of quantum needling carrying around in my head, the idea here is I'm going to apply a large transverse field to the system. So now I get my superposition states, so all my spins are now in that combination of spin up plus spin down. And I'm going to slowly diminish the magnitude of that transverse field and eventually bring myself down to that classical Hamiltonian. So this is exactly the experiment that was carried out by Brooke et al., so in this particular research group that I referred to earlier. I pardon that the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, some of the fonts are a bit small in this, in this graph here. I grabbed something from their, from their article and tried to put things in a sort of a condensed but yet simple form to present here. So we'll go through this slide really carefully here. I'll take my time here. So first thing is that's, of course, Brooke et al. sort of cartoon picture of quantum annealing versus thermal annealing. So they have a crystal of this material. It's doubtlessly polycrystalline, not a single unit, single crystal. It's been doped. Uh, with, with these random spin halves, give you the give you this classic trend, uh, classic spin glass material, and what they wanted to do was carry this system through thermal annealing first, and then quantum annealing, and look at the final state of, that they got of that magnetic system and say, well, which one worked better? Which one presumably gives you a lower free energy at the end of the day? Central diagram you here see here is a phase diagram. It's temperature in Kelvin on the horizontal axis has transverse magnetic field on the vertical axis. So, so in particular, the three different phases I can point to is there's a, what G here is a spin glass phase. So that's that random looking spin orientation. Uh, there's a ferromagnetic phase where all the spins are relatively well aligned. And then there's a paramagnetic phase where the spins essentially have nothing to do with each other whatsoever. So when we start at high temperature, so in high temperature being on the order of one Kelvin for this system, We'll start over here. Thermal annealing is like going along this, this axis right along transverse field equals zero. And then you bring yourself up to this point C just to get into this glassy phase a little, a little more deep here. Quantum annealing, as they've described it, is we're going to crank up for transverse magnetic field, then cool the system, and then bring ourselves down to this point C into the glassy phase. So we have these two different routes to get into the spin glass phase. These four plots that I show around the outside here are all measurements of the real part of the linear susceptibility as a function of frequency at different points along the way <coughs> of, of the, the annealing processes. So the key thing to look at is the color, color, uh, the color key. The blue points are the classical measurements or the classical thermal annealing process. And then the red points in all four of these plots are from the so-called so -called quantum or quantum annealing process. So, First off, first, if I start at this point A, so if I just draw a line right here, my classical measurement is down here on the transverse field equals zero point, and then I have my transverse field here for my quantum annealing process. So if I just measure what the susceptibility looks like at these two points, well, as a function of frequency, it looks like they fall right on top of each other. Nothing really seems to be different at all in these two systems. But as the, as the annealing progresses, as the, if I go to the point B, which is lower temperature around 0.4 Kelvin, now you start to see a separation. So now it looks like the susceptibility, the linear susceptibility of this quantum annealing process is higher. What that is implying is that the system is relatively more free. It hasn't decided to localize quite yet. Now as this, as this algorithm goes further, so the thermal annealing process, recall I come right along, right along transverse field equals zero up to here, and I come a little ways in the spin glass phase, versus the quantum annealing progress process where I came across the top here at finite transverse, so it's field cooled, and then dropped my transverse field down to get in the spin glass phase, you end up with the two maps of susceptibility versus frequency that you see over here. And then there ends up being a fairly substantial difference in the susceptibility. 
So again, it's implying that this system here, if I walk it through this, trans through this annealing algorithm with the transverse field present, I still have this relatively free movement. What it means is I have less localized domains stuck in the system. I'll somehow manage to sort of circumvent some of those local minima in the potential energy landscape. And then as a cross check, what these folks did in this measurement is they took both systems back up to point D, which takes you through this spin glass paramagnetic phase transition. And of course, lo and behold, things are reversible at that point. And the two, and the two <coughs> paths up to point D converge once again. So that's made a nice story um, when it was published at the time. Uh, folks said, all right, so this looks like if you try this quantum annealing algorithm on this crystalline condensed matter system, it looks like it does make a difference compared to a thermal annealing process. But the question is, you know, does that really show that quantum annealing works in any regard? So in particular, sort of worry about it is, well, first things first is, did they really show they went to, got to a better ground state at the end of the day? The answer is no. Uh, of course, this is a condensed matter system. It's like, you know, 10 to the 20 something spins sitting inside of it. They don't know what the ground state is. They have no way of measuring those individual spins. You can't really convincingly say that you have achieved the ground state via quantum annealing in the system. You can't even really outright say that you've actually beaten thermal annealing in that regard. The other thing is the measurement that they did provide in the end was just this linear susceptibility versus frequency. So if you go back to, thermal, to your thermodynamics textbooks, linear susceptibility for a magnetic system is a second derivative of the free energy. So of course what it says is that where quantum annealing process has gotten you someplace where that potential energy is obviously steeper. So we've got the higher linear susceptibility. Does that necessarily imply a deeper potential? Have you actually achieved a lower energy? Well, Maybe. I think it's pretty ambiguous. So you really can't say, looking at this measurement, it was hailed at the time as sort of as you know, one of the existence proofs that quantum annealing is going to work for you. And it's like, well, yeah, maybe. But I think it really it, it, it does leave lots more room for experimental investigation. And that's where we were headed with our system is I really do view quantum annealing as experimental research, as build a system, actually study that process in detail. Okay, so on to pitfalls in quantum annealing. How can things go completely wrong with this sort of process? So I'll tie everything back first is, I'm gonna tie, slightly modify my notation for what I mean by that quantum annealing algorithm and the Hamiltonian that I present here. This has the same pieces that you'd seen earlier. So the blue is, like, is for the transverse field, that's the quantum part of the process, and the red is what controls the classical final Hamiltonian that you're trying to minimize. What I show here are some energy scales. So I'll put some energy units on the system. Um, I'm going to have this transverse field give me an energy splitting gamma. That's a function of my parameter S, which controls my quantum annealing. And then the script J is what controls the overall energy scale of the problem Hamiltonian. Okay. Now quantum annealing, if I want to look at the system, with this system with the energy scales in it, well, all, I, all I need to do that is I have to be able to tune gamma starting at s equals zero. I need it much, much bigger than j. j need not need be exactly zero. And then of course at the end of the process I need to flip those two where j is much, much bigger than gamma. The most natural way when discussing quantum annealing to look at the system is look at the eigenspectrum as a function of this annealing parameter s. Ultimately, quantum annealing is all about building, guiding your system through, through an evolution of, the, of that eigenspectrum. So a particular example I've just sketched for you here is if I have an eight qubit ring like this, all ferromagnetic bonds in it, really simple system, obviously easy to find the ground state, but it gets you the right sort of picture of what can happen along the way. So this, never mind about the absolute energy scale here, I just happen to use the rice parameters, one of the processes that we have have at D-Wave right now, and so that's online. Um, the general features you're looking for is, so here's the horizontal axis is that annealing parameter S, and then obviously energy on the vertical axis here. The way the whole process works is if I start at the left at S equals zero, <coughs> over there my system is in those large superposition states, and as I run the annealing process along, what you can see is that in my, my manifold of excited states is coming crashing down relatively quickly here, but then there's always an inflection point along the way. And you can see the uh, states are disappearing up here. So this is the interesting part, is that of course starting back here, system looks like that giant harmonic oscillator. All my, all my spins are in those superposition states. 
as I go along in here, what's happening is pieces of the superposition are being cast away. They're essentially being thrown out as being not part of what is going to be in my final ground state of the system. So very high energy states or spin configurations are getting tossed out along the way. However, you can see much of the action seems to occur right around this sort of very clear inflection point. So what's happening there is if I make a very large system like this, that eventually becomes a quantum critical point. That's a quantum phase transition. So this is what I'm going to denote as QCP up here. So of course, people who study, study transverse Ising model systems know all about this. This is the whole field is about trying to find quantum phase transitions. So this is where the system suddenly seems to make a very distinct choice. It says, the ground state then looks, looks at itself and says, all right, which pieces actually fit that final Hamiltonian at the end of the day? And these are the pieces that get guided out here. And so you can see from my very simple system, it's all spins up or all spins down. Those become my ordered phase. Those are my ground states for this very trivial example. My disordered states up here, well, these are all the ones that where I have a kink in this chain. So in this case, what would happen then is if I have a spin flip, right, say between those two points, and then thus obviously becomes an excited state. And of course, this is a ring, so it comes back around. There's got to be a spin flip someplace else along the way too. Okay, so this was a really useful picture to start looking how do things go wrong. Yes? What is H on the y-axis? Oh, H on the y-axis. Oh, Planck's constant. Yeah. Okay, so if we just start with this trivial picture, I can easily guide you through the sorts of things that can go wrong with the whole quantum healing process. First thing is this the phase transition itself. So obviously with this trivial, trivial system, it's not particularly big. That's not a very harsh phase transition, quote unquote, to use that term loosely. But when we start thinking about macroscopically large systems, like you would have with a condensed matter system, then that energy gap between what become, eventually becomes my ground states and this manifold of excited states, that can get incredibly small. And that, of course, becomes trouble one way because you're inevitably running this annealing algorithm at finite speed you're going to come through that phase transition at some finite rate. You're eventually going to have non-equilibrium dynamics occurring within, around the vicinity of phase transition. So in particular, what I'll show you eventually is you can come up with particularly malicious points along the way where you can have a first order phase transition during quantum annealing. And those things can be particularly harsh. Next thing you can do is, well, you can have complete violation of adiabaticity. So in particular, what you're worried about here is you can picture where I start out my system definitively in the ground state at s equals zero. And then I do this quantum annealing algorithm so fast that I essentially buckshot probability up into the excited states along the way. So if you've ever seen a landau zener transition, well, that's what all this is about in the end. So we'll go into that, look at that a little more. The other thing that can happen is, well, of course, if you've got a condensed matter system and you're doing this, you're coupled to an environment, guaranteed. So your system is thermalized at a particular temperature. Well, that means there's a bath of phonons sitting around. You can always exchange energy with those phonons. So of course, that can happen in this picture here, is you may have a temperature that's relatively low on this horizontal axis, such that you can guarantee to get into the ground state quite easily. But as the annealing progresses, you worry then, are these energies, as I approach the quantum phase trans transition, am I going to have excitation and then relaxation, relaxation occurring with that environment. So there you get this picture that you're going to start out in the ground state, you're going to go through this region, there's going to be relax where thermalization becomes an issue, and eventually as we pitter out here, as we pass through the quantum phase transition, the system freezes, and effectively you lock in some sort of thermal distribution that you, along the way. And of course, the final thing that will happen in all these systems at the end is the absolute train wreck, which is you're strongly coupled to your environment at the end of the day. So recall that the quantum annealing algorithm starts out with a very large transverse field, just to put all my spins in the superposition state, but inevitably I'm taking that transverse field to zero at the end of the quantum annealing algorithm. That transverse field component, that gamma I said, once that thing gets to be much, much less than the coupling to the, to the environment, at that point your whole picture of this being a quantum system is wrong. You have to give up. Rather, the, what happens is the transverse field component becomes perturbative compared to the environment. Okay, so I had those four things that can go wrong. I'm not going to go through them in any particular order here. Just slowly work through, work through the details, uh, just to give you a little more idea about how, how things can play out here. So 
One of the sort of archetypal ways people think about what could go wrong here, for instance, the violation of adibaticity is the Landau-Zener process. So this is something I alluded to earlier, where, for instance, I could have some cartoon eigenspectrum as I've drawn here. Let's say I start out where that black dot is on the left. I put myself in the ground state. It's all going well. I'm going through some minimum gap, G min, that occurs along, along the way. But I'm going to my parameter S, I'm changing at some finite speed. And I'm going to characterize that speed by that parameter alpha, as I've written on the slides here. So the point is, for any finite speed, I am inevitably going to end up with some probability going through a diabatic process and ending up where I, over to the right where I have P L subscript LZ written. So a landau zener transition with some given probability. You've probably seen that formula to the left before in different, in, in different scenarios here. But the same sort of thing rolls out here. Um, what this really says is if I'm really worried about getting probability down in the ground state is I end up, I can phrase that as an adiabatic condition. Well, I'm looking at is this exponential. Uh, obviously, I want this negative quantity to be much, much greater than one. So uh, I wrote, oops, I got that tangled up. Um, obviously, we want this probability to be very low. So obviously, I take that much greater than one. So what that says is that I need my speed, my speed to be much, oops, I got that <laughs> around. That's what's wrong there. That's supposed to be flipped there, pardon me. Um, obviously, I need to be able to have my gap energy scales much, much greater than my speed. So, obviously, I've turned that around. So, the big question here is, when we look at quantum annealing in general, is how is that G min sort of scaling with problem size? Well, it depends upon the problem, as lots of people will tell you. So, there's lots of fights in the literature right now about, well, how, what does G min look like? And you can sort of dream up all sorts of evil schemes to make this thing fail at the end of the day. Another useful way to think about the system, what I'm more used to, is thinking about this in terms of the kibble zurich mechanism. Um, whereas landau zener that tends to be a nice way of thinking about small scale systems, single qubits, few qubits. Um, if you're looking at large scale system, you're looking at macroscopic systems and looking at phase transitions, this is much more the preferred route. That's more, the more natural language to describe it. And the idea here is that I'm gonna have some parameter that's controlling me, controlling a phase transition particular one is so called lambda here. I'm going to have that ratio of the transverse field gamma over the script J. This becomes a useful parameter for these transverse icing models. You'll see that again on lecture number three when we go through, when we go through quantum phase transitions there. Inevitably, there will be a critical value of that lambda, as I've known by lambda C, where the system undergoes a, fan, undergoes a phase transition. So in particular, what I'm worried about are symmetric, uh, where I'm starting out from a symmetric paramagnetic-like phase and going to a broken symmetry phase. Whether that's a ferromagnet or a spin glass phase on the other side depends upon the particular problem you're looking at. So of course, as I've told you before, inevitably we're running this thing at finite speed. So we're starting at s equals zero and we're going to end up at s equals one within some finite amount of time. So we're going to have this process where eventually we're gonna come into this regime close to the critical point and you can roughly characterize that evolution of lambda as some linear, linear uh, linear function of time, so my critical value of lambda, and then some speed v, which depends on that multiplying s as I've drawn there. So heuristically, the picture you can have here is that you can think of this as sort of a three-step process. Um, you're going to start out with a system evolving adiabatically. Obviously, gaps are big. The system is in a paramagnetic phase. It's easily following it. So as I've drawn here, this is just a six-qubit chain, just, or a six-bit chain, just to give you a picture of what's going on. So back here in the symmetric phase, the system is in a superposition state, spin up, spin down. Uh, it's looking at all possible combinations at once. Um, there is no zero, or the magnetization is zero at every single site at that point. Eventually, what's going to happen as I approach this phase transition is, I'm gonna to start to develop correlations between my spins. So there's a correlation length Z, as I've, as I've indicated here. That thing starts to grow as I approach a phase transition. Now, of course, a macroscopic or, macros or a thermodynamically large system, Z diverges right at phase transition. And that's so correlations across the entire length, length of the system. Well, Z is also heading towards the divergence. It ends up that the relaxation time scales for the system, tau, are also diverging. So I have growing correlations, but the system is getting increasingly slower. It's responding slower and slower to these changes. So inevitably, what's happening along the way is I start out with my adiabatic evolution on the left, and then I enter what's called the impulse phase. 
At that point, I'm starting to evolve the system so fast it can't keep up. And so now I start generating localized domains in my system. So as I've drawn with my cartoon here on the top, what I've implied is that we have two magnetic domains that have nuclei at the ends of my chain. They have some finite correlation length and they die off into the middle. And then, as I pass through that phase transition, sort of non-adiabatically, eventually it locks. So as I've drawn to the right here, now I have two domains, spin up on the left and spin right on, spin down, or spin up on the right, spin down on the left. And those two eventually just hit, and now I, have, now I have this domain wall living in the middle here. So what's happened is I've frozen in an excitation just because I've run through the second order phase transition at a finite speed. So that was second order phase transitions. It ends up there's an even nastier way that you can get quantum annealing to fail, and that's a first order phase transition. So recall the first order phase transition is where I'm gonna take a system, it's gonna start out in some particular localized spin state, and it has to make a rapid decision to go to a completely different spin state that may be unrelated to the first, and maybe a very large handing distance between those two. So that's a case where you can end up with a very small gap at the anti-crossing. Micro, uh, as I'll, I'll give you an example if I have time, and so the, you're likely to make a landau zener type process or transition through, the, through that point. So in particular, if you want to make that happen in a quantum annealing, system, in a quantum annealing algorithm, there is a prescription for making that come out. Uh, it was first, uh, first documented down here in, the, in this PRA article by Mohammed Amin, Dickie Choi, employees of D-Wave, uh, that was grabbed, on by, grabbed onto by other folks who said, aha, we found the mechanism how we can make quantum annealing fail, guaranteed. Um, Next slide, though, it gets a little more interesting. The way you make this happen is you construct a final Hamiltonian at s equals one, such that it has a unique ground state, so something that solves that problem for you, and that has a highly degenerate first excited state, many, many first excited states. The idea here is if I start here at s equals one, that's thoroughly a classical Hamiltonian. And as I start working my way backwards here, recall what's happening is I'm turning on that gamma, that transverse field component. What does that do for you? Well, it has to lift the degeneracy of these first excited states. So you can construct a problem where that lifting of degeneracy causes enough curvature that you can bring that first excited state crashing right through the ground state. And in particular, you can make that happen very late in the anneal, so close to S equals one. So if you recall with the quantum annealing algorithm, if I'm close to S equals one, I'm in that regime where gamma is much, much less than J which means that tunneling or superpositions, all those things are weakly perturbative. So if you want to make this algorithm fail, make your phase transition happen as close to S equals one as you possibly can. So this particular case of how you can actually make this happen by construction. So, but of course, there were lots of folks who fought back on this and said, well, what you've done in that case is you've, you've allowed yourself a uniform transverse magnetic field applied to the system to run this quantum annealing algorithm. What if you allow yourself a locally varied uh, transverse magnetic field? How does that affect the system? So here's that same quantum annealing Hal uh, Hamiltonian I showed you earlier. All I've done is I've added one more component to this, uh, this mu i, this dimensionless quantity in here. What I'm gonna allow myself to do is locally scale that transverse magnetic field on my individual spins. So it ends up, Ed Fari of MIT took this thing and said, well, actually, if I just take my mu's, mu i's, and I choose two values randomly, and I throw out these problems, guess what? I can slay just about any first order phase transition I, come, I see come by me. And the whole idea here is that if I have some particular final target Hamiltonian, the guy in red here, that I want to solve, is I can run this repeatedly. I can just choose my sets of mu i's, run it, choose a new set of mu i's, and run it, and keep going until I find, I find the solution that I at least say is good enough to solve my problem. Of course, folks at D-Wave decided to go a little further. In particular, this was one fellow, Neil Dixon, who worked with D-Wave for a long time, Muhammad Amin again. And they came up with an algorithmic way of busting down those first order phase transitions. It's based on a feedback measurement. Essentially, you run this quantum annealing algorithm fast. You actually induce landau zener transitions by intention. Then you look at the probability statistics coming out at that point. Essentially, you've sampled all the first excited states very quickly. And so now you can say, well, I want to avoid going to those states. So what you do is you design your mu i's to penalize ever going to those states with the quantum annealing algorithm. And essentially, you start plucking off those excited states one by one 
and bias your quantum annealing algorithm to completely avoid them, and then you end up back in the ground state again. This is particularly neat. We are actually working on this actively right now and, and building, building in the knobs into hardware so you can actually do this. Okay, now on to the issue of decoherence. So first thing I'm gonna tackle is weak coupling to the environment and then we'll deal with strong coupling thereafter. So should be familiar with what we do with, with weak coupling to the environment while well, we go to perturbation theory. That's what we'd all do. We'd have some Hamiltonian that we will, that's, that's sort of our isolated or closed quantum system. And we'll have a Hamiltonian for the environment and then a coupling to that environment, some bath here. So as I've denoted here, I've just taken my single transversizing spin. So I have some energy splitting that I'd shown you earlier. Then I'm applying my bath, my interaction here. And what do you get in perturbation theory? Well, first thing you get is a slight variation of those energy levels. So you get a renormalization. Uh, you can see just, I've just indicated by the slight shifts of these guys. Presumably you can renormalize your spin parameters. You can basically change your spin moment and handle that. The other thing that you get out of that, of course, are transitions. So this gamma up, gamma down, so the upward and downward transitions. In particular, what we're concerned about, you looked at that condensed matter system that I described earlier. Your, your, your environment really can be described as a thermal bath at that point, so you can think about thermal activ activation and relaxation. And it all has to, you know, all has to be uh, consistent with thermodynamics at the end of the day. So, uh, of course, what you can do is that gives you enough right there that you can calculate T1. So you can calculate that relaxation time for the, for the first excited ground state and then the first excited state. What you should be thinking of then is what's that small parameter in perturbation theory? So that's why one way to write it is I said, well, Q, I've defined this thing as gamma times T1. Um, with my factors of h bar, just get my units all right here. So this becomes the small parameter in quantum annealing. Or pardon me, this has to be a large parameter. Uh, inverse of 1 over q is the small parameter in perturbation theory. Um, as long as q is large, what that says is that the T1 effects, are, are the, the relaxation processes, are going to be subdominant to the Hamiltonian that you're trying to assert for quantum annealing. So very important in quantum annealing is that your Hamiltonian is on all the time. You're continuously asserting it. And if you're in this regime where Q is large, then it's strong compared to the environment. However, eventually you're going to hit that point. As I've said, quantum annealing algorithm, you run gamma all the way to the point where it's very, very small. You expect Q is going to dive less than one at some point, at which point all bets are off. Perturbation theory does not apply. So if I go back to my eigenspectrum picture of how this works, then what you can see is that, what we'll have, so I've shown my eigenspectrum here on the left, and on the right, what I'm showing is a calculation of Q. Again, this just happens to be for one of the processors that we have live in the system, live at D-Wave right now. And then from, based upon all our, all our calibration, I'd be able to predict what that thing Q looks like. What you get there is a coherence crossover. You can't really draw a sharp line and say, uh, to, left, to the right here is coherent, to the left it's incoherent. Rather, there's this mushy region where that Q is getting of order one, and you don't want to be working there. The important thing that matters when we design these quantum annealing processors is that we want our quantum critical points, this QCP I've uh, indicated, absolutely needs to precede that coherence crossover. If I have things in that order, at least at that point, I can consider my environment perturbative. That, uh, that closed system Hamiltonian, that eigenspectrum is representative of the problem I'm trying to run. And then I get through my quantum critical point. At that point, my, my system freezes. I get my spin states. I read out, read out the problem. I don't worry about the evolution after once I've gone into that cross that, cross that coherence crossover. Where you can really run yourself into trouble with these systems is if I have a Hamiltonian where I put that quantum critical point out here, good luck. That will not work. At that point, essentially, you're asking for quantum mechanics in a region where it's just not going to help you at the end of the day. Okay. So the other part of the story, of course, is that thermalization. So I've said that, of course, you need to be able to keep in mind where quantum critical points relative to this coherence crossover. But inevitably, you also have this thermalization. So as I've indicated by here, if I have a thermal environment and I'm obeying thermodynamics along the way, as I run this annealing process, the system is going to try to thermalize to its environment. It wants to achieve thermal equilibrium. How is it going to do that? Well, there are those transition rates up and down. As I start out the quantum annealing algorithm, the gap between ground and the first excited state manifold can be absolutely huge. 
relaxation rates are going to completely dominate thermalization or excitation rates. And as I run along here, what's happening, of course, is I am changing the matrix elements between, between, between states of the system where the perturbation that's, that's fueling all this are, are my, my environmental modes. So my transition rates are changing, as I have indicated sort of by the thickness of the arrows as I run along here. So as, I, as I'm continuing along, my transition rates both up and down are dropping. However, the upward transition rates are coming up. And eventually, as I run through my quantum critical point, eventually all those transition rates dive off to zero and the system freeze. So now, as I said, when you worry about decoherence, first thing, as I said, is you have to be able to get your quantum critical points before you go into the incoherent regime. And the second thing you have to worry about is this whole thermalization picture. The other part of decoherence we can talk about is dephasing. So the important point here is that in the quantum annealing algorithm, at least as implemented in the energy eigenbasis, you're not worried about relative phases between, <coughs> between eigenstates. So if I have a system, or if I have a particular iteration of the process, I'm running it, I start at s equals zero, I start in the ground state with certainty. As I run along here, if I get thermally activated up in here, I'm not worried about the relative phase between these two different components of the wave function along the way. However, where the dephasing still kicks you in the end is all the physics that goes into the, in the dephasing processes that the gate model community worries about. Same thing bothers us. Essentially what it means is that every time you run the system, your Hamiltonian is wiggling a little bit. There are slight perturbations to that eigenspectrum along the way. It's a, sort of like a shot-to-shot -shot variation of the problem each time you run it. So if, as I've shown in the solid red lines here, maybe that's the ideal system I'm trying to run. But a uh, particular, uh, particular iteration of this algorithm, I could end up with the dashed eigenspectrum here. So in particular, what can happen is, for instance, the ground state here, recall this was a ferromagnetic instance, so it has a degenerate ground state of all spin up, all spin down. I can break that degeneracy. So just for this particular system, it ends up with this random flux biases on, on the individual spins. That's enough to do it. Uh, those random biases can also change what's happening here at the anti-crossing. So in particular, you can see that my gap between, between ground states and that first excited state manifold, it could be wiggling up and down a little bit, which is going to impact thermalization. So it ends up all this physics, all the things that people worry about the gate model quantum community, they matter to us in quantum annealing as well. You just got to phrase them differently. Okay. What time am I supposed to be finished? I haven't heard any stomachs mm -hmm. grumble yet, 12, so. 12.15? Okay, and we're just a little before 12 here. Um, okay, we'll go through this one here. So I've given you sort of the, you know, the four evil things that can happen to quantum annealing. Can we put them together and actually look at a particular instance and see some of that stuff going on? Um, I'm not going to go into the depths of this particular experiment, how we, how we built it. I just want to focus on the results at the end of the day. So this is from, from a, from, from a D-Way paper, Neil Dixon and Company, uh, Nature Communications. Um, the idea here is Neil created a particular evil instance. He asked, well, I told you that story about first order phase transitions, so he went and created one for us. And the way he did it was with a 16 qubit instance, relatively small, and you actually get enough physics coming out of it. The idea here is he created a system where the ground state is all ferromagnetic, ferromagnetically ordered, all spins down. And the first excited states, it ends up, you can, you can produce a very large degeneracy, 256-fold degenerate first excited state. The idea here is that we have some core rings of all spin up, ferromagnetically ordered, but these guys out on the periphery out here, they look at them and say, yeah, I don't care, I can be spin up, spin down. I'll take whatever way it goes. So that gives you the high degeneracy you want. The way that works out in detail is that you have an interaction across here, there's basically a flux bias coming from one qubit in the central core, and then there's a local bias that's applied to that spin, and if those two cancel, then this guy here just sits at degeneracy. So when you calibrate a processor and, then get, and predict what that eigenspectrum looks like, here's what this diagram is over here on the right side. So in particular, as Neil has highlighted, this looks like here's the ground state in green, and then this whole collection of first excited states, the lowest one of that, which he denotes as sigma in blue here. And what happens is you get this particularly harsh anti-crossing G min, the minimum gap is buried deep down here on this scale. If you blow that scale up, if you look in through here, Using those device parameters, it predicted the gap of 20 microkelvin. And of course, this is a system that's running at 10 millikelvin, something like that. So 
horrendously small anti-crossing. So the odds of a landau zener process going through here looks pretty high. Okay. So Neil and company decided to run this whole experiment as a function of temperature and as a function of annealing time, see what happens along the way. So what I'm showing you here is a collection of measurements. Each one of these lines is a, is a particular annealing time. Long times were here, I believe, on the orders of you know, micros or milliseconds. And then a short annealing time is getting around the order of one microsecond. So we have a whole sequence of lines here. And then as a varying function of temperature. And we're looking at the probability of getting into the ground states, PGS, as a function of temperature and anneal time. What you see happening is that of course, you'd expect thermalization processes should generally kick you up to an excited state. Oh, that sounds bad. There should be landau zener processes, also bad. Should all be bad news along the way. However, the interesting thing that you see here is that we started out here. If we look at very long anneal times, that whole story sort of fits together. So if you're at very low temperature, your probability for a long anneal time probably getting the ground state is one. That just says I've evolved the system extremely slow compared to that G min. But as I crank up temperature, you can see that my probability is going down. As I go very fast, I should be asking for trouble from landau zener crossings. So, but in this case, what you can see is that, that, is that if I just choose some sort of relatively fast, fast annealing time, first probability goes up. Eh, it seems I sort of left out. So the question is, what's going on there? So this first part where you see things going up ends up, this is sort of a, an interesting process. This is a case where all those sorts of things have actually produced a very an unexpected result. First thing that can happen is I can start out in this state right here, which is my ground state sigma early in the anneal. Then it switches my and GS becomes the ground state late in the anneal. And here's my particularly harsh anti-crossing. Ends up in this case, you can actually have thermal excitation before you reach the anti-crossing, land those inner process through, you're in the ground state. So in this particular case, that Combination of landau zener and thermalization somehow has actually worked out to your benefit at the end of the day. And of course, as I said, the other thing you have is thermal relaxation. So even if you've gone through like this, relaxation's on your side. And again, it's helping to push, give you increased ground state probability. Now, of course, this can only help you so much. You can say, well, that's great. So I'm going to keep turning up my temperature knob. And eventually, obviously, it fails. And of course, you can see as all these guys bend and they go back down the other way. And what's happening there is of course, as thermalization eventually becomes enough that you're no longer in that ground first excited state manifold. Rather, you're going all the way up in those higher excited states. You see by the delta E indicated on that little cartoon on the top right here. So thermalization helps you, but only so much in this sort of picture. All I'm trying to convey with this is that it, the story gets complicated very quickly. When you look at all these things that could go wrong during the whole annealing process, sometimes they work in unexpected ways. Okay, so universality. So once again, just bring up that Hamiltonian. I've left the mu i's out here for right now for simplicity. So that's the whole basic quantum annealing algorithm. As I've described it, the objective at the end of the day was to solve that classical Hamiltonian, that red guy on the other end. However, it is certainly, you can build a quantum system out of that if you look at intermediate s. So s of less than one, you have that finite transverse field present. And of course, as I said, there are whole books, textbooks written on transverse Ising model. Um, you can go ahead and look this stuff up. Lots, lots of people have spent a lot of research, research resources looking at that particular model. So, however, you are limited in the, sort of the types of quantum systems that you can look at with this sort of thing. So, as I said, transversizing model. And the real issue is this. If I look at the ground state of that system for intermediate S, I guarantee you that you can construct it looking like as I've written down in here. So where that thing is a superposition over all my localized spin states with positive coefficients. So it's you know, state one plus state two plus state three with all my coefficients and of course normalized to one at the end of the day. So that sort of system where you have all positive signs between your, between your ground state components, it's known as stochastic in the literature. You'll hear that word over and over again if you're looking in the field of quantum annealing. And the reason why that matters is because those Probability amplitudes with positive sign, of course, they can map on probability, which is you know amplitude squared. There's a one-to-one -one mapping between those two. You don't have to worry about any sign flips along the way. So it ends up there is an established numerical method known as quantum Monte Carlo that you can then use 
to study the, we figure out what is that ground state. So you can actually take a quantum annealing system and calculate its equilibrium equal, equilibrium pro, uh, properties using quantum Monte Carlo. Uh, quantum Monte Carlo, of course, is no good for studying dynamics of these systems. You will get it completely wrong. It just gives you the equilibrium probabilities along the way. Now, why does that matter? Well, of course, if you're a condensed matter physicist, I actually come from a condensed matter background as well. I, my love before all this was course, D-Way superconductors. Uh, I spent six years banging my head against the wall trying to figure out what makes those things tick. I did not figure it out. Uh, I have my own house. Um, obviously, very interesting systems. Uh, if you're a condensed matter physicist, you love fermions. Um, and of course, signs matter. If I'm thinking about interesting ground states for those systems, well, often with fermionic system, of course, I'm going to get negative signs all over that ground state. So a simplest system I picture is like ground state of hydrogen, where I have proton spin and electron spin. I can get my ground state of that thing is then, is then the spin of, is that anti-symmetric or that combination with the negative sign in there. Um, Slater determinants. So if I have a bunch of identical fermions, I'm calculating the ground state of that thing. Well, I'm going to calculate a Slater determinant. And you know that there's negative signs all over the place in there. So the interesting ground states for condensed matter systems are non-stochastic. So where is that coming from? Where, where do you get the right ingredients that would give you something that's non-stochastic and then give you an inter a really interesting quantum simulator, at least interesting beyond those transverse IC models? And you can see where it comes from just by looking at those interactions. So I said this whole quantum annealing picture as it is right now is based upon that Ising model. And that's just a sigma z, sigma z interaction between my spins. It's constrained by whatever's breaking symmetry in this Ising system. However, if you really want a fun, sort of rich interaction, you're thinking about Heisenberg interactions. And there you have sigma x, sigma x plus sigma y, sigma y plus sigma z, sigma z interactions. Get all those along the way, and then you get all the beauty, beauty of, those, of those fermionic systems coming out. So there are people thinking about that in the context of quantum annealing. Uh, in particular, I can point to you to one, one reference uh, from 2008, Diamante and Love. These two gentlemen were working at D-Wave at the time uh, when they wrote this. Uh, they came boy, well, down to two practical options. Um, so, you know, Heisenberg would be nice if you'd implement it. Um, however, you can actually boil it down to some basic, some more, some more basic set of interactions that gives you all the same physics at the end of the day. What they said is that you could come up with these two possible universal Hamiltonians. So it has the same pieces as what I'd shown you earlier. You have, well, the delta I, this was the gamma that I'd shown you earlier. Um, this is just tunneling energy of the individual qubit, it's transverse field. My one local biases, so that was the H that I'd shown you earlier and all those, all those uh, quantum annealing algorithms. However, what I'm going to allow for is XX interactions, ZZ interactions. The other option you have is sigma X, sigma Z, plus sigma Z, sigma X going the other direction. Either way here, it ends up there's enough physics right there that you can model all those fermionic systems. All you need is you have to be able to have the deltas, the epsilons, and those j's. They have to be all sine and magnitude tunable. And that becomes sort of your basic building block set for making a universal quantum simulator. OK. So, hey, finishing on time. I'm a good lecturer, am I, right? Um, so message that I want you to leave with, quantum annealing is a physically motivated method for <coughs> algorithms for, for solving problems. Here we're really looking at this as a two-way conversation between computing and physics, and we're saying, well, can we find a physical process and harness it for computing? Um, quantum annealing, when you when you set it up as I've demonstrated here, where the when it's all done in the energy eigen basis, a laboratory reference frame, it has some advantages to it. So thermalization can help, can hinder, um, depending, upon, depending upon particular circumstances. However, as I've told you, it's by no means entirely immune to noise. I think finally, of course, this is the big question for me as an experimentalist is, you know, does quantum annealing actually give you any advantage over something like simulated annealing, thermal annealing processes? That's very much an open question that, hey, that's where I think the fun is. I get to actually build experiments and actually look at these systems. So, and that's, <coughs> I'm done for today. So unfortunately, you guys got to be victim for first victims of the slide set, hence my, my apologize for the few typos. I think those worked out.
So how much control do you have actually over the Simpson decoupling okay. in, in these chips? Oh, and the processors, uh, those things are completely tunable to a fairly high precision, like 1% precision. And are they, once you have a specific chip, then you can tune it within there? Yes, that's right. Tunable on the fly. You can program it as you go. Uh, to solve interesting problems, have you, is our 1D system sufficient, or do you need no. to do no, 1D systems are trivial. I mean, but they're the art <coughs> system. If you look in textbooks, that's the thing to compare to. That's I've kept all my examples here, just the 1D, just to keep things simple. But wait for Wednesday. Um, we do a 3D system. Much more fun. Yes. So in a page, previously you just mentioned that the the IC model corresponds to the NP bus, <coughs> while the high spread model corresponds to the QCP uh, PQP bus. Yes. So what problem? Corresponds to cloud. Is yeah. it fighting the ground state of specific model or? Yeah. So when I say NP, well, that's just non-deterministic non polynomials. Yeah. So that means any optimization, classical optimization problem. Yeah. As for BQP, I mean that's finding some ground state with with some given certainty or some bounded certainty. Um, again, that can be any electronic system you think of. I mean, it's, you want to find a ground state of it. So which means that. Uh, <coughs> How many spins about can you get together where all of the interactions are tunable? So, <coughs> well, when we build hardware, it's well, this is what turns into what's called the embedding problem, uh, which is inevitably when we build hardware, it's all these localized spins, which are flux qubits. Obviously, a spin over here has a tough time talking to spin over here. So the question is, can you actually slave together qubits and actually have degrees of freedom interact by this way? Well, I'm going to show you an example on Wednesday how we do that. So if you have full control over the couplings and bias fields, what's stopping you from doing actual full computation instead of simulation and annealing? So we do use it for computations, yeah. yeah it was heavily used. Um, I mean, that's one lecture I thought about giving, but I didn't in the end. Um, so the uses for the for the things like D-Wave hardware, um, I've been utterly blown away by the number of ideas people have thrown at and how they're computing with it. Uh, just to give you an idea of what's going on. Um, so the language, much of what I present here, I discussed sort of in terms of optimization. You're going to have some final target Hamiltonian. You want to find a ground state, or if at least a low, low enough energy state compared to some cost function to optimize your problem. Um, the other area where people are using this a lot right now is machine learning. So if you have any touch on the world of neural, neural networks, for instance, um, so people are using our hardware extensively where the H's and J's and that classical Hamiltonian, they become the parameters from some tunable neural network. And so what you'll be doing is throwing data at the system and trying to learn H's and J's that then give you this, net, this network that then recognizes things or you know, do what you will with machine learning at that point. So how more fundamental question. Yeah. Uh, the model that you showed, the Hamiltonian, did not seem to have a symmetry. It did not seem to have the Z2 symmetry that's spontaneously broken to get the order space. Yeah. So why do we see a second order space transition? Okay, so that case, I mean, the paramagnet to ferromagnetic phase transition, um, I mean, it should be second order. Uh, you stumped me right now. Sorry, the HI sigma ZI term? Yes, yeah. okay, H, HI is equal to zero. Yeah, take it at that. It's just J's. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> so, if what is preparing a um, sort of annealing process to um, what we saw earlier in the morning with gates and um, sort of these sort of direct manipulations? Uh, I noticed that this is really framed in terms of Hamiltonians. That's right. And the other side of it is really phrased in terms of the direct unitary. That's right. And I've had the impression that sometimes it can be um, quite a challenge even to figure out for very long times um, what either what Hamiltonian gives you a certain unitary or what unitary you get from running a particular Hamiltonian for an arbitrary amount of time. And so can you comment on how that 
whether that mapping is something that uh, you're looking into or how. Okay, so where that fits into our picture is you're running quantum annealing at a finite speed or non-zero speed. So obviously this whole picture of instantaneous eigenspectrum, if I go infinitely slow, that is correct. However, when I'm running at finite speed, then I'm looking at those landau zener type picture. So again, what's going to happen is I am launching probability. You can still start out with that picture of that instantaneous eigenspectrum, but as I run it fast enough, eventually I'm just sort of buckshotting, buckshotting probability into all those higher exciting states. Yeah, question. And uh, uh, getting back to sort of decoherence and dephasing, I, I guess it's sort of useful to think of dephasing as causing a line width, a broadening. Yeah. So in your sort of pathological. That's like a Gaussian broadening in a lot yeah. of cases, yes. So in your sort of pathological case with a 20 micro Kelvin <laughs> yeah. minimum gap, what sort of uh, T2 would you need in order to not just. Uh, smear out that gap completely. Okay, so if you wanted to actually see that gap, uh, I mean, if you want to make a coherent measurement of that gap, it'd be incredibly long. So that's the whole point of this: is that the there's no way that that is a coherent crossing between those two points. Definitely incoherent. So um, of course, what's happening is you've got thermal activation on either side as well. So I mean, inevitably with these sort of system, if you get those. I mean, think about a quantum phase transition in these materials, you're never going to resolve that perfect, you know, broadening free gap. Never going to happen. It's always going to have some breadth to it, which means you're going to have non-equilibrium non dynamics somewhere just approaching as you approach that phase transition point. You will go into a non-equilibrium regime. You mean assuming that, that T2 is, is short? That's right. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, 20 micro Kelvin is is huge energy on a scale of sort of seconds t2 mm -hmm. but not on a sort of nanosecond no. it's a good reference again i think it was on slide 6.4 was dixon and amin on tuning the local bias fields yeah. to avoid yeah. these crossings that one yeah that's the one thank you yeah that's a neat paper i think that's been relatively underappreciated up to this point. Universal quantum computing requires not just the ZZ interactions. You're in, oh, you're in yeah. those XX interactions too. And the, the other thing that's, yeah, we don't have XX interactions in this version of the hardware. And the other part of it is also a single qubit tunneling energy, so the deltas. Um, those things you need to be sign tunable as well um, the, the, to achieve universality. That is a lot harder than it looks. Um, so flux qubits, they of course give you, um, you can. You can get a negative delta out of that, which gives you this plus, you know, spin up plus spin down to ground state. If you want spin up mi minus spin down to be ground state, you have to flip the sign of delta. Yeah, it's classical stationary bit. So, okay. so it's actually just the uh, dimensionality of the. Uh, so, what the off diagonal coupling is give you are Hoffman terms. Yeah. 
functionality to have a mobile excitation to be helped. Uh, what about like if you diagonalize the something that may have uh, you know just shifting the phases to say not of the higher phases or whatever. Say not of the net. That's what she should ask, right? Would you like um, to pin for me liquid and not for Oh yeah, we have two category so eigenbases. Diagonalize not banana and not a banana. So but <laughs> you have to find that basis. That's the problem. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So it seems to me that the your editing quantum computing model is somehow based on the ground state of Hamilton. And uh, so I know there's some result from the math community that they proved that the the spectral gap is somehow undecided. And the way they do that is the uh, is the following. So they encoded a Turing machine in the ground state of Hamilton. And uh, they can just, yeah, so they can do the mapping be between two states. One is the, um, the, the machine we are hopes, but the other is not. So they just somehow map two kinds of um, Hamiltonian into two coding states. So uh, it seems very interesting to me that in that sense, the ground state can somehow map to a decided state. So I just want to know, I mean, is there any kind of a because I didn't, many, at that, many, when, when I read that, I didn't make no idea that it's just collide. connecting the ground state of Hamilton to the physical, physical system. system. But after that, I just think that uh, yeah. is there any, like, uh, yeah. as far as you know, any thought about yeah. so there are a whole bunch of things that kind of look like this. You look at the one night and you just look at the bank and maybe pinch it to the ground state. Yeah, nothing in general. A couple of people have been looking at specific problem classes. So they're trying to determine what they can come up with asymptotic behavior for large systems. Because it's quantum, you're completely doomed if I find the right problem set. So we're looking at things like satisfy the building problems, for instance. Tuning that, there's a critical point in that where the clause to variable ratio matters. So tune up to the point where there is no satisfying solution. Or the right problem set is if you get some right solution close to that. Things like that. Um, lots of fights, as far as I can tell. Dust has not set up on that. So we know that the ground state here is 